This episode of Satellite Sisters is brought to you by Lost and Found in Paris by me, Leon Dolan. That's right, my new book is out April 5th. It's an art history treasure hunt with romance, wit, intrigue, and Paris. C'est magique. Lost and Found in Paris comes out in April, but you can pre-order now at your favorite local indie or at any online book retailer. That's right. Order now. Spend April in Paris. Merci. You're listening to Satellite Sisters. What's a satellite sister? The person you call when the best thing in your life happens or the worst. The person that gets you up, gets you going, and gets you through. And every once in a while, changes your mind. This podcast is part pep talk, part weekly check-in. Like grabbing coffee with a friend. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Satellite Sisterhood. You're listening to Satellite Sisters. We are so happy you're here today. I'm Leon Dolan. I'm a producer. I'm a podcaster. And my new book, Lost and Found in Paris, is coming out in April. Woo! <laughs> I live in Pasadena, California. I'm the youngest sister. And Julie, today you have our question of the week. Yes, this is Julie Dolan. I'm the oldest sister. I live in Dallas, uh, Texas. And here, sisters, you know, over the weekend, they have a new professional combat sport debut in Florida. Of course, it's pillow fighting, <laughs> professional <laughs> pillow fighting. Yes, it took place January 29th. There was a title belt awarded and a cash prize of $5,000. What do you think, Liz, about pillow fighting as a professional sport? Okay, well, this is Liz Dolan. I'm the middle sister. I'm in Santa Monica. I'm in marketing. Personally, I'd much rather get hit by a pillow than a fist. So I'm go I, I think this seems like fun, not so permanently damaging. Why not? I say, why not professional pillow fighting? Okay, Leanne, how about you? You know, we did a lot of pillow fighting as children. Uh, I thought it was professional level. I mean, I, I don't know about you all, but my brother, Brendan, smacked me silly with those pillows. I mean, he was three years older, had quite a few pounds on me. He, he'd say, I'll get on my knees, Leanne. He, that was his concession to me. And then he just beat the stuffing out of me with that pillow. So I'm not sure it's a kinder, gentler sport. My ears are still ringing from 1972 pillow fights. What about you, Joel? Well, I don't think it's pickleball, but I do think that it allows a lot of people to get involved in a fun sport, right? Everybody has a pillow. Okay. So let's start fighting. <laughs> <laughs> you can really burn off some aggression with that. Uh, I think so. Our sisters, Sheila and Monica, they were quite the pillow fighters growing up. Too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they had, you know, they had that competitive edge, the will to kill each other. Right. You just can't teach people, you know, you really can't teach it's that. True. It's true. <laughs> Okay. Uh, today on the show, we're super happy to welcome writer Carol Wallace. Carol is literally an old friend of the family. She grew up down the street from us, but she's also the author of 24 books, you guys. She's written 24 books over the years, both fiction. I know, fiction and nonfiction. Her latest book is called Our Kind of People, and it's about the Gilded Age, okay? So if you're enjoying the HBO series, The Gilded Age, you absolutely want to read Carol's book because it fills in a lot of the background. But she's also one of the original authors of the Preppy Handbook. That's right. When she was in her early 20s, she sat down and wrote about Madras and all kinds of really important things to Preppy people. So uh, she's had an amazing career, and we're we're going to talk to her about that today. Uh, Julie, you're doing an expose into small appliances. That sounds small, very small appliance talk, Leanne. And yeah. there is a right small appliance for each sister. Oh, <laughs> coming up. <laughs> Thank you. Can't wait. All right. We have a little more Olympics talk because, you know, it's us. We love the Olympics. Liz, you have some fun insight into uh, some, an aspect of an athlete's life going yeah. to the Olympics. Olympic huh? logistics, Leanne. It's, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, especially this year. Okay. And, uh, oh, and I have an exciting real estate story. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that. But uh, first, Liz, you have a big Satellite Sisters shout out, don't you? That's right. I think it's the day to give, what is our highest Satellite Sister honor that we award here on the show, sisters? I know it's solid gold Satellite Sister, but didn't we used to have awards, Leanne, that we gave out? Yeah. The Sassies, Liz. The sassies. We gave out Sassy Awards. How can awards. you forget? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, well, I would like to give a solid gold sassy to longtime friend of the show, Suzanne Smith. Now, she is someone that I have mentioned before on the show. Uh, we know each other from working in the sports business together for a long time. And Suzanne Smith is currently the only woman directing NFL games. Okay, the only woman at any network directing NFL games. So I got this text from her on Friday saying, I often think of your Satellite Sisters slogan, which is just to remind everyone, not every conversation will change your life, but any conversation can. So she goes on, this morning I had a convo with my boss. Sunday, I'll be directing the AFC championship game in Kansas City our lead director out as of 1 p.m. today, and that's for a positive COVID test. So there you go. She gets, she has this conversation with her boss. So I text her back. I'm like, well, that's great, Suzanne. Have you ever done like a championship game before? And she responds and says, no, no woman has ever done a playoff game, a championship game, or a Super Bowl. So that's unbelievably huge. Yeah. I mean, it's just a huge deal. And here's another part of the huge deal. Normally you have at least a week to prep for a game like this. So she's like, you know, you get told on Friday, the game's on Sunday. Wow. So, um, so she's, here's what she said about that experience, having to turn it around so quickly. And I should say at the end of last summer, she got promoted to be the number two director at CBS Sports for football. So that was a big deal too. So mm -hmm. she's been in the on-deck circle for so, so long. long. Just decades. to mix, Literally to mix some sports metaphors there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, she said, here's what she said when I asked about the experience in a text. She said, it was like being the backup quarterback going in due to injury, but you were just traded to the team the day before. You know <laughs> You know some of the players from your past teams. You've crossed paths with some of the coaches over the years, but you don't know the playbook. Yes, you're a good QB, but you've got less than 48 hours to learn the offense, study the defense, and prep for the biggest game of your life. Oh, love the football analogy. That's <laughs> very strong. You know, and for people that don't understand like what a director does at a live sporting event, it's an unbelievably hard job, especially for live football, because you imagine you're the person you're the person in the truck calling all the shots, right? Literally but, calling the shots like yes. go to camera two, go to camera six, go to this. Let's do the replay 700 times. Yes. All right. Let's do it 701 times. Yeah. It just yeah. takes a lot of practice and a lot of skill. And one of the unique skills of being like a live football director is you have to be able to anticipate what's going to happen next. You have to like, in your mind, you're always figuring out what are they going to do now? Or what are the choices? And I know from having talked to Suzanne a lot, when she comes to LA for a game, I often see her for dinner before, and she will have just finished being briefed by the two teams about kind of their game plan. And so she knows a little bit more about what to expect and what the moves are going to be and the players. On the field. Oh, I didn't realize that. Huh? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So so this is like, okay, you don't get any of that. No time for that. No, no, just, just, just start doing it. And uh, anyway, she did it. First woman yeah. ever in all of sports. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just think it's an amazing thing worth mentioning, right? Right. I do too, Liz. Great, great for her. Great for the sport. And uh, she is our satellite sister gold. Yeah. Right. But let's also mention that. She got the gig because of COVID. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, right. obviously years and years and years and years of training and totally ready for the, but like, the, thank goodness that like she was there ready to go. But so, and again, you know, it's a very unusual year. So it was a unique way uh, to get that opportunity. And for as fantastically skilled as she is and for as far as she come, it's also worth mentioning that she's still the only woman directing NFL games. Oh. So the, and one thing, Suzanne, I know this so much about her. She spends so much time on mentoring and trying to bring other people along, men and women, but she's just incredibly supportive of all of the other women in the business. So for that, and for being the first woman ever, our highest satellite sister award to, uh, to Suzanne Smith 
And by the boo, just because this kind of stuff matters, I looked it up this morning. The AFC, imagine this. Okay, it's your first day at work. You get thrown in. They're 60.99 million viewers. (laughs) So that's that's it. That's no pressure there. No. The AFC championship game drew 47.85 million viewers on CBS and it peaked at 60.9 million viewers. She was the Bengals Chiefs game was the most viewed conference championship game in that Sunday window uh, in six years. So brava, Suzanne really pulled it out and obviously we were wildly entertained. Yeah, fantastic job. That's great. Yeah, I just a note too. I mean, almost every network now it feels like broadcast football. So it used to be just a couple of networks. Yeah, but the only one across any network. You know, so Fox, NBC, ESPN. Right. Uh, they all broadcast football now, and she's the only one over there at CBS. So yeah. great job, great job. Okay, okay Julie, well, we're on to like something now. different. Right and now, I feel really stupid. <laughs> I would not have agreed to talk about this had I had I realized the full extent of Suzanne's achievement. But nonetheless, I come to you today with yet another unusual accident story. Uh, You know, we started off this year. uh, I reported on my flying saucer accident where I managed to create a snaggle tooth with my front tooth. Well, today I'm before the mic with a small but very discernible mark under my eye. And I achieved this with a dryer ball. Let me explain. Now in my house, I have stackable washer and dryer. The dryer's on top and I was uh, drying my laundry. They were my Brooklyn and sheets. I have my wonderful all wool New Zealand dryer balls in there just moving around. Um, The dryer stopped. And as, as it happens very frequently, you know, your sheets get all tangled up. So I attempted to pull the sheets out of um, the dryer and out comes flying. And I believe it was 10, maybe 20 miles an hour. A dryer ball came right at my eye and hit me in the eye. <laughs> okay. I mean, well, uh, the and, and it made a mark under, under my eyes. So uh, Something going on with you, Julie, that we don't know. I don't know. I I feel like my hair is going to catch on fire next. (laughs) I mean, that's, you know, these things come in three, but I don't even know how that happened. But there was quite a force with the dry dryer ball. It surprised me. It pushed me back. (laughs) You're right. I can really do some damage. In contrast to Suzanne's accomplishments, this this does seem like a particularly sad story. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. She's achieving such great things. I'm there struggling with my sheets. Yeah. Get injured. Well, okay. Everybody is carrying a burden you don't know about. And you, <laughs> you, you are carrying your dryer balls. Well, so Julie, we wish you uh, thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Thanks, sisters. So, so sincere of you. Yeah. Well, I was very busy this weekend, mainly just staring out the window because the most exciting thing to ever happen in our neighborhood since we moved in is happening. The house across the street is on the market. Okay. And it hasn't been for sale for 50 years, right? The previous owners have lived there since 1971. I did know them. They were an older couple, a whole family. My husband had gone to high school with the kids. The mom passed away this summer at age, I think, 95, 96. Mrs. Uh, My friend Kathy died. And so um, the family has decided to sell the house. Uh, It's a beautiful English tutor. It's such a pretty house, Um, but it's been a rental for 10 years. So there've been a lot of people in and out for 10 years, but now it's going on the market. And I am just Mrs. Kravitz. I mean, I, <laughs> I have been, I have been on this like mysterious moving truck showed up in December since the renters just seemed to flee the property. I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> then there was a lot of activity. Then there was, you know, construction and there's some fixing up and then like more trucks appeared and the stagers came and then the photographer came with the, you know, the drone and he's flying all over. And I just want to report everything that's happening, but my husband and family have zero interest. And so I have found a kindred spirit in the other neighbor across the street. So I refer to myself as Mrs. Kravitz and he refers to himself as Mr. Kravitz. And so we do a lot of texting back and forth, texting back and forth about what's happening. When is it going on? 
they had an open house on Sunday. I am not kidding you when I say hundreds and hundreds of people showed up. Right. Wow. I, I mean, I had well, never Maybe seen you'll it. get some very nice neighbors, Leanne. I'm I mean, excited about that, Julie. Okay. Okay. I'm excited about fresh new neighbors because, you know, I, neighbors. you know, well, it's when a house is a rental, it's a different kind of feeling than buying into the neighborhood. And, and, you know, we've had some turnover on the street and I've enjoyed our new neighbors. It's been nice. So we're looking forward to some permanent neighbors. Mr. and Mrs. Mr. Kravitz and I are looking forward to some permanent neighbors mm-hmm. over there. But at one point I jokingly said, to Barrick, I should have set up a book stand outside to sell books because <laughs> yeah. I could have really moved some copies of the Sweeney Sisters or Helen of Pasadena. Yeah, have a and little I, like wine tasting and book <laughs> and book sales. That it would have been nice. nice. I really uh-huh. missed an opportunity, and I, I actually had to do. A, I did a book um, talk this weekend that I had donated for a charity auction, so I had to leave my post observing the open house. So I texted Mr. Kravitz. I'm like, I'm leaving. He's like, we're coming home from the soccer game. His daughter literally set up her Girl Scout cookie. Oh, wow. Thing she had just picked them up, completely sold out of Girl Scout cookies <laughs> at the open house. Perfect. Completely That's nailed it. That's- so it was, it's been exciting. I don't know what I'm going to do for fun when the new neighbors move in. It's going to be sad, but I won't have anything to stare out the window at. It'll just be me and the bird feeder is the other. That's the other alternative is my bird feeder. But are, are you it. and Mr. Kravitz allowed to institute any sort of interview process for potential buyers <laughs> no. you, can you weigh in see having your own stand would have been a sly way to at least talk to the people and form some opinions about who you want to be the new neighbor that's but, what he was able to do with the stand talk yeah. to a lot of people and they said there's just quote no inventory on which is why this house drew a lot of attention okay so and it was just, so anyway liz more later but i have enjoyed my reign as mrs kravitz don't think okay. i won't be watching the neighbors all, i will be all right watching. don't forget the welcome gift li- 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 <laughs> oh you know it yeah oh, you- i want right in oh i'm going right over i want right in this time <laughs> Okay, well, I have some shocking news that, you know, I'm always scanning to find uh, stories that we can talk about on the podcast. And I saw this headline in the New York Times that said that air fryers were going to replace toasters. And I thought this can't be right. This, you know how much we love toast. I mean, how am I, what, (laughs) right? Yes. Right. What am I going to do if there are no toasters anymore? But this is so I did a deep dive into the whole world of air fryers versus convection baking ovens. Now, I I didn't I didn't I don't own an air fryer. Do either of you own air uh, air fryers? I know they were they've since 2017. They've been like a really hot appliance to have. Yes. No, 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 I do not own one. They're I really don't large. understand them. I really, yeah. when I see pictures of like eggplant Parmesan coming out of an air fryer, I'm like, what is happening? No, okay. I don't well, understand. Liz, Julie. Here it is in a, a one simple equation. Air frying equals convection baking. Did you know that? No, yes. yeah, let me not. say that again, even though there are <laughs> baskets involved, this is really the key to your understanding air frying equals convection baking. So well, then by, by what standard is that frying? Well, it's not really frying at all. It's a convection oven. It's like a little mini convection oven. Okay. So the New York Times wire cutter, they do deep dives and make recommendations about the best of the best. And they're saying that the Cuisinart convection toaster oven, which toasts nine slices of toast, so toast is safe, okay, yeah. so it's Oof. still safe, um, that this really is the best of what they're calling the air fryers, okay? Convection ovens, toaster ovens are going head to head against air fryers. <laughs> Are you understanding this? This is really big, big news. So if it really depends on your lifestyle, whether you want to get one of these mini convection oven toaster ovens, or you want to get the pod shape um, air fryers. Now, I mean, it has to do with counter size. So like Liz, for you, you have everyone who's watched Cooking with Liz knows you have pretty limited counter counter space Mm -hmm. and most of it has like uh, laptops and you know uh, computer (laughs) no all kinds of filming stuff on it exactly Um, if you should go for the air fryer if you cook mainly frozen food okay that um uh you know leon that's not your uh, lifestyle you do make a lot of toast leon you should go for the convection oven i think you have room in your kitchen in all the nooks and crannies to put a, a, a mini 
I have a mini convection oven. That's what I have. I absolutely love it. Well, it's then you have an air fryer because they're the same thing. (laughs) You didn't know it. You didn't know it. You like to cook a variety of food. Okay, Liz, do you even make toast? I don't know if you make toast. No, okay. I no, very rarely. Okay. Okay. You're, you're moving in the air fryer category. Okay. Back to there. Liz, <laughs> this is really you. If you prefer the casual approach to cooking, which is assembl- essentially dumping things in a basket. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what the air fryer pod has. Okay. <laughs> Leanne, if yeah. you don't mind turning food over, which I think you enjoy doing, right? I do. Going in the oven and turning things up. Then you should stick with the convection toaster oven. Okay, Okay, Julie. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Leon, if you want a faster cleanup convection toaster oven, all right? Uh It's a little trickier to to clean up the air fryer. You see that? Okay. And Liz, are you okay with uneven browning? I think we all know (laughs) the answer to that. (laughs) I think I am. I think I can live with that. Yeah. Okay. So Uh, there it is. Okay. This is just mind blowing to me that these are the same. These are the same small (laughs) appliances and there's one for each one of you. Okay. And toast is safe. Okay. That's all I'm saying. So, um, you know where I make my toast, Julie, a toaster. I I, just, I put it in a regular toaster. So I think I'm just sticking with that. Okay, I got into this whole world because I thought they were going to get rid of toasters and they might because now you have either the air fryer or the mini convection oven. You better really sort of pick your lane and stay in it. That's what I'm thinking is happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Julie, this is fascinating. Thank you. (laughs) I know. Dryer balls, toaster ovens. I'm bringing it all today, sisters. (laughs) Well, as long as we're talking about my, you know, relatively low standards when it comes to cooking. Um, I do want to remind people that this Thursday, February 3rd, is the debut of Cooking with Liz on the new channel where it will appear live, and that is the Satellite Sisters YouTube channel. And so Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, I'm going to attempt to do my first live show on YouTube. I've never done it before. Fingers crossed, people. Okay, this is exciting. Yeah. Yes. I want to point out because a, you know, a listener very conveniently pointed out to me that there is a YouTube channel called Cooking with Liz, because of course there is, because it's the stupidest name ever, Cooking with Liz. That is not where I am appearing. I am on the Satellite Sisters channel. We are trying to consolidate all kinds of Satellite Sisters stuff together in one place. So look for me on the Satellite Sisters channel. And the best way to find it is to go there now, just enter in Satellite Sisters channel and, and subscribe. That way, whenever I go live or whenever we post a new video, even of higher quality, like high Satellite Sisters content, then you get notified that there's a new video on the Satellite Sisters YouTube channel. So I'll see some of you there Thursday and we'll be talking about my baking projects. I will just leave it at that because we've had enough small appliance talk already today. Okay. (laughs) Have you, did you watch a YouTube video on how to go live on YouTube? Yes, I have. Oh, yes. Okay, good. I just, but I watched sure. it a couple of weeks ago, Leanne, and now I forget. So I have to, Review I have that. to watch it again this afternoon. I might have to do a secret test with one of you just to make sure I sure. actually know how to do it. So, all right. Well, I believe in you, Liz. I believe in you. <laughs> Thank you. <Leanne>. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Coming up, we're going to be talking to Carol Wallace. Carol is the New York Times bestselling author of To Marry an English Lord, which inspired the hit TV drama Downton Abbey. She is back writing about the worlds of the wealthy. Our Kind of People is the first novel from Carol in a decade, and it explores the themes of social and economic class, family bonds, changing time, and the courage it takes to forge your own path. So stay with us. Carol Wallace, next up on Satellite Sisters. Liz, it's time. I am going to set myself up for a better and brighter year. Are you okay? You go, Leanne. Yes. Well, <laughs> where do you start with that? I am starting with our new sponsor, Everly Well. I'm excited to welcome them to Satellite Sisters because Everly Well is an at home lab test company that gives you physician reviewed results and personalized insights so you can take action on your health and wellness. Take All action. I like it. 
Yeah, I'm doing it, Liz. I'm taking action at an affordable and transparent cost. They have over 30 different lab tests. Okay, so if you're curious about things like sensitivity, food sensitivity, metabolism, sleep and stress, thyroid, you can take those tests in the comfort of your own home, as people like to say, and then get the results back privately, uh, you know, very quickly, Uh and then take them to your doctor for further discussion. And that's what's happening for me. I did the metabolism test. Oh, okay. So okay. Liz, you and I both did these tests at home, yes. right? Yes. Everly ships us the test. Right. Super easy. Everything you need for a simple sample collection. Very okay. simple. Very explicit in the directions. Easy to follow. Yeah. Fantastic website. If you have any questions, lots of how-to videos. Yes. two videos. I appreciated all that. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I like the at-home bit because you know what I hate doing? Waking up really early for those fasting blood tests that you have mm-hmm. to go do and somehow getting yourself to the blood thing without any coffee, Liz, that's hard to do. And we know I how have, you feel about coffee, Leanne. Then I have to get back in the car and drive home. Yeah. Still, still yeah. no coffee. So with Everly Well, I could just get up, you know, pad into my bathroom, mm-hmm. do the test as prescribed. I don't, I didn't, couldn't brush my teeth. That's fine. Cause you're at home. You're not yeah. interacting with human beings <laughs> and then ship them the results. And they ship the responses right back to me. The results, it was fantastic. Right, right. Comes to your email, came to my email and text. Really, really easy. And now I have some really good numbers to take to my doctor. I have an appointment in a month. And I thought this is a starting point for a discussion on health and wellness. For listeners of Satellite Sisters, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash sisters. That's Everlywell dot com slash sisters for 20% off your at-home lab test. Everlywell.com slash sisters. Thanks, Everlywell. We're super happy to welcome Carol Wallace back to Satellite Sisters. Her new book, Our Kind of People, is just a really juicy Gilded Age story. And Carol, welcome back. And you have really caught the moment, the Gilded Age. Why is it having such a happening right now with TV, books? What's going on? What did you know, Carol? What did you know? <laughs> if I knew what I'd known, I would have I would have made a lot more money before now. There you go. Um, I, you know, this it it comes up every now and then, right? This kind of um, uh, fascination with big money, and uh, it was about time. That's all I can think of. Um, you know, there is a lot of money washing around, and sometimes we like to process that culturally by looking back at how it used to be handled. That's mm-hmm. about the best I can do. It's not particularly um, interesting, really. But you don't think Julian Fellows is just stealing your ideas because you wrote <laughs> to marry an English lord, and that inspired Downton Abbey. And then you write our kind of people, and oh, lo and behold, Julian Fellows has a show on HBO called The Gilded Age. Come on, Carol, does he have your passwords to your computer? What's happening? <laughs> yeah, I just you know, Julian. Much as I mean, he's a lovely guy. I I have like a ninety five thousand passwords, so I don't think that would help. Okay. Um, <laughs> But um, I think, first of all, I think he honestly is a fellow with a really keen uh, sense of the zeitgeist. He, he just knows what we want when we're going to want it. Another way to look at it is that this is what Julian writes about, is this kind of high level, truthfully, high level social climbing. Yeah. And uh, every now and then the culture comes back to where Julian is. So take your pick. Okay. Well, I read Our Kind of People, and it's just a really wonderful book about the Gilded Age. It's really juicy. You have so many facts in there. It's like a great primer if you're right. watching the TV show. Wouldn't you say that, Julie? Oh, oh, yes. So super satisfying to read this book, Carol. You know, and I, I might even read it a second time just oh. because, <laughs> no, just because it's, it's, you know, you just get into the whole age and the, and the families and, and all the like gossiping things that are going on. But then you all also have so many interesting cultural details in yeah. this as well. Yeah. Well, How my you- head is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you speak. So <laughs> it's a good thing you good. stopped. Good. <laughs> How do you decide though? With historical fiction, it's always interesting to me 
is it's so tempting. You also write nonfiction. So, you know, you write nonfiction, you write fiction, you've written a million books. How do you decide where does the nonfiction end and the fiction start? Like, are you tempted to just keep researching, researching, or throwing everything in the book that you've, you've learned about the building of railroads in 19th century New York? And then you're like, oh gosh, this isn't fiction at all. How does that work for you? Um, uh, When I get bored, um, and the railroad part, actually, to my, um, I have mixed feelings about this, the railroad part, my um, oldest son, who's like a tech guy in San Francisco, said that was the only part of the book he liked, wow. <laughs> <laughs> which wow. is kind of sweet. I mean, he read the book. That was really nice. Yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, this is a girl book, right? Um, yeah. So uh, I think you have a sense of when you're getting boring. Uh, You know, it's like that moment in a cocktail party when you're talking to somebody and you just see that flicker when they look away from you to somebody more interesting. (laughs) That's what happens in my head. I start looking for somebody more interesting. Yeah, you're right, though. Your book is really of mothers and daughters or friends and frenemies. So what are you thinking about in terms of female relationships when you crafted those characters? Were you thinking about, oh, this is what I want to talk about, or these are the people involved. Let's see what, uh, you know, evolves with their relationship. I think it was more the latter. I think it was, I mean, like, like you ladies, I mean, there's a, there's a certain, um, kind of way that women in a family communicate. And I guess I didn't, know this at the time when I started but I guess I find that very interesting for for obvious reasons being the middle of three sisters Mm -hmm. and I think it's partly maybe also this is just occurring to me women tend to be um, very observant about things I care about like social behavior and clothes so maybe also (laughs) um, (laughs) I I was licensed by writing about women licensed to be as shallow as I wanted (laughs) you know but there's a lot of heart in your characters I know you know that like you what you have is an old money woman who marries into new money and then her daughters sort of have to forage a new path there in New York when only old money counts and uh which again i don't want to say it julian fellows but that's pretty much the story of the gilded age too (laughs) so um, well but but and that the reason that is the case is because that was the case historically so if basically if you're going to do um any kind of historical fiction around uh upper class women i mean pretty much any time right Uh, it's the women tend have tended to take care of social um Uh, social activities for the family maybe and there's always a social climbing thing and we could get down and dirty and talk about Southport Connecticut in the 1960s but let's not (laughs) we have other fish to fry I wrote a book about it you can read about it Uh, so exactly Carol though we did actually get a question on our Facebook page I recommended your book and someone read it and wanted to know about the character name Jemima like where oh. did that come from? It was unfamiliar to her. So she wanted to know what made you pick that name and, and why that name? Oh, uh, that's wow. That is a reader who pays attention to detail. Yeah, right. Um, so there was, um, you guys may or may not know that I have also written many day- baby name books. Which I think you were on Satellite yeah. Sisters to talk yes. about your See, baby. There you name go. Book. Exactly. So, yeah. Which is much less. You may not remember, but we right. remember. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> exactly. As because long as one of us remembers, I think we're good uh, to continue to discuss. I think we're safe. So, um, Jemima is actually a name from the Old Testament. And um, I gave that character that name to sort of um, show that this family had kind of old New York old protestant kind of roots um and that's really the only reason okay all right but still that's a good story though she can she just never heard that name so yes we have excellent readers in the satellite sisterhood very careful very careful readers now have you you've been out touring doing uh virtual tour stuff what have you found that people are responding to in our kind of people i have i have not done much actually um so you guys are really it and um the responses I've been getting have been really sort of individual. So uh, I think mostly, um, I think, but the sense I get is that people are really enjoying diving into the 
kind of uh, lavish quality of the life mm -hmm. that some women led. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. It, it does surprise me. I mean, when reading the book, I don't think of Americans as behaving like that with footmen and things like <laughs> like that. And I think of Americans as being a much more open society. And I was a hundred percent dead wrong based on your book. And also. I, I just hadn't really put together that all the rich people used to live downtown in New York and then they all moved uptown. Like, I didn't really put that together either. Is that super obvious to everyone but me, Carol? <laughs> at, um, I mean, why would you do this? But if you look at maps of New York or photographs of New York from the 1880s, which are available all over the internet, then that particular, the, particularly the architecture, that all becomes very clear. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, I found it really fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Are there similarities between sort of the cutthroat, cutthroat social aspect of the Gilded Age and what's happening now? I mean, in your book, you have like one matron who's in charge of everything. I think she's based on Mrs. Astor, who we see in the TV series. Like, are there people like that in New York now that are technically in charge of society? And, you know, if they tap you on the shoulder, you're one of the 400 and lucky you. Does that still exist? I don't think it does. I think uh, the money is really fragmented. There's so much of it. And there are certainly um, little enclaves that where there might be some kind of social control that actually holds, uh, holds things together. But uh, I don't think the kind of monolithic uh, social culture I was writing about uh, exists to the same extent anymore. I think it's a much more of a question of smaller pods of, of different kinds of people. Got it. Got it. Well, that's good news. So any one of us can enter New York society. We're ready now. Uh, <laughs> We've oh, you're, you're so ready. I mean, you already know how to walk up and down the stairs. So that's <laughs> the battle. Okay. I, I'm going to go back to the enduring legacy of the preppy handbook. All right. I mean, Carol, how old were you when you worked on that? Oh gosh. Uh, 26 or 27. Uh, okay. Really a child. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that book at the time sold over a million copies, correct? It was like a little humor book that you guys wrote for, it seemed like about 12 people. And like oh, the next thing you know, it became a cultural phenomenon. Did you have any idea at 26 that you would be contributing to, you know, a, a, that kind of a legacy? I had so little idea of this actually that I took on a job. This is the irony, it's so extraordinary. Uh, I worked on the Preppy Handbook and just as it was being published, I, because I needed money, was doing the Christmas sales gig at Brooks Brothers, <laughs> selling ties. This is not even an exaggeration. So the entire world is discovering that there's this kind of weird little subculture out there. And I have written a quarter of the book that talks about this and reveals this amazing world to all comers. And yes, I am I'm working behind the shirt counter. Yep. Okay. That, it's very funny. I have been listening to a podcast and it is about Bennington College in the 80s, <laughs> but there are multiple preppy handbook references to it. And I just think that book comes up still regularly on a regular basis. Do you, are we the first ones to ask you about it in a long time? Or do people yes. come to you about that and talk about it? Because I'm just surprised what a touchstone it is. Like I was surprised when I left Connecticut for college in California that people had the book. I was like, why would you have the book? What, <laughs> this is not written for you. That people used it as a guidebook was so weird to me. I thought it was like a book about the people we knew. But, um, you know, here you are in a podcast just this week, like Bennington College, you know, Donna Tartt and Brett Easton Ellis referring to the Preppy Handbook. Does it surprise you? Yes, it continues to surprise me because it seemed to me at the time like such a small and easily forgotten subculture. And yet maybe in some way that I still haven't figured out that preppy world, the world of the country club and the yacht club or, or whatever, you, however you want to describe it, it does stand in for some kind of social experience that a lot of people find deeply attractive. Mm, yeah. Mm. Do you think Julian Fellows will be making a preppy handbook mini series? <laughs> <laughs> that would be so funny. And as as we say this, you know, I'm just imagining myself on the front porch, the you know, the sandy beach porch, 
of the Country Club of Fairfield with Julian Fellows, and my mind is just reeling. <laughs> okay, make make it happen, Carol. Yeah. Make it happen, <laughs> Carol. I was a lifeguard there, so I'm happy to contribute in any <laughs> research. Okay. Maybe Julian advisor. can't. Yeah, and maybe Julian can't swim, so you could save him. Yes, <laughs> I'm happy to. Yeah, but he had to wait out a long time in that sticky mud. So, you know. <laughs> as if I think you die if you go into Long Island Sound now. I don't I don't know. I'm afraid <laughs> to swim there. Yeah. All right. Well, if you are enjoying The Gilded Age on HBO, even if you haven't even seen The Gilded Age, Our Kind of People is Carol Wallace's new book. It's rich with detail, fantastic female relationships, some cutthroat social climbing situations, and just really enjoyable to read. Carol, thanks so much for being on Satellite Sisters. Thank you. You. It's great to see all of you. Thanks so much. All right, everybody, this is Leanne. Just a reminder uh, if you want to know what's happening in the Satellite Sisters world, our newsletter is a great way to find that out. You can subscribe to Pep Talk um, right at our website, satellitesisters.com. If you go there, a sign up sheet will pop up. Just give us your email address. And then every week that we do a show, there will be a, a pep talk in your inbox. Uh, every Friday, it's a little bit of pep talk. It's links to fun things that we like that we may or may not mention on the show. It's a to-do list. It's, you know, all kinds of reminders for Satellite Sisters events. And, you know, you get a lot of extra stuff there. It's a lot of fun. I it is a lot of fun. <laughs> Lynn, you had that dip recipe this past week. <laughs> yeah. I cut that, that out. A, oh, that yeah. Was a good oh, yeah. One. I'm, make, I'm making some dip. Yeah, sure. Sure. And because I personally have a lot of events coming up with the launch of my book on April 5th, um, I will be posting a lot of book things in, in pep talk and probably even sending out a book specific one. Uh, but this week I am starting to announce dates, actual signings and things like that. And that's over at my website, leandolan.com with events. So the easiest way to do that is to to subscribe to pep talk um, because I will have a book launch on the sixth here in Pasadena at Froman's. I'm doing a bunch of other events all over the country, including a signing in Southport, Connecticut on May 12th. Um, there will be online events if you can't come to an in-person event, but those details are all over at leandolan.com slash events. So that's it. Very exciting as I lock down these things. Now, some of these things are still TBD. So i um, in terms of like time and zoom link and things, things like that, but I, I'm trying, I'm just one woman, but I'm trying to, to work it all out, but looking forward to that starting April 5th. Okay. Oh, very I wanted, yeah, it is exciting. No, I'm excited now. Am I shouting? Because I am excited now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, two months, it's two months out. Shouting and, and it, talking very fast. Yes. Yes. Okay. Every, it's starting to hit me like, oh, I've just been working on this book for so long. So here it comes finally out in the world. Um, all right. In other news, that's not about me. I wanted to do some follow-ups. First of all, Julie, I just have to thank you because uh, you have really spurred a whole new category of posts on Facebook. People are posting their brooches. Okay. <laughs> that we really appre appreciate. Big brooch energy, right? I mean, Slap those pins on, girls. You know, what are you and waiting they, for? What are you waiting yeah. for? I mean, they, they are until they they've posting come on trend the next time in 30 years. No, this is your moment. Get those out. Yeah. I mean, people have been harboring a lot of brooches. The people have been even like putting together brooch balls, which is <laughs> I know. So. I and I love the shadow box. What a great idea. How you know how sentimental that is to have a shadow box with like your mother's or your grandmother's brooches in it. I loved it. Okay, so brooches are popular. Tulips are popular, Julie, because you mentioned how uh, sing and flower arranging. That's my go. new sport. I bought some. Uh, I bought some tulips this week, uh, and because I um, I'm a member of the Satellite Sister Facebook group, I I found a tip that I did not know that if you put a penny in the uh, in the uh, in the base of the uh, tulip vase uh it keeps the tulips fresher my tulips look fantastic okay don't and ask me why i don't know <laughs> that is not my tip somebody somebody in the group had that tip put a pen try it okay no follow-up questions on that one and Liz, you know, your homage to Betty Crocker has resulted in many people digging up and posting photos of their Betty Crocker homemaker award pin. 
which it's, both is both a pin and a brooch and a yes. Betty Crocker thing. Mm-hmm. So, and a lot of people have like their original Betty Crocker kids cookbook, other vintage cookbooks from Betty Crocker. Yeah, well, she's a hundred years old. There's a lot of that merch out there. Yep. Okay. So thank you. It's replaced cheese boards and caps as our most popular <laughs> posting topics. <laughs> good. That's good. All right. On a more serious note, we just want to send all the best to our satellite, Mr. Dave. Uh, Dave is a frequent poster over there at the Facebook group, and he posted this week something sort of astonishing. Um, he was sent to the emergency room last Thursday because he was in acute distress with COVID-related heart failure very serious. He's only 50. He's 56 years old. He eats right. He works out three times. Apparently before the vaccine, he had a mild case of COVID and now he's had the virus did a real number on his heart, as he said, and it had slowly stopped functioning properly. So he said there were no warning signs, no catastrophic event. He just started feeling lousy. And he just wanted to remind people that this can happen. And if you have had COVID or think you might have had COVID and you start feeling badly, feeling off, feeling tired or winded, go to the ER. He just went to the doctor and they immediately sent him to oh, the wow. ER. He is doing okay now, but we just want to send all our best to Dave. And um you know, I think it's important to take care of yourself and these things are real. This is a real virus that can do Mm -hmm. real damage to people. And so Dave, we just wish you all the best. He said, we are not calling this heart failure. I have a heart that needs specialized care. Mm -hmm. Care. It is not failed. And our job doctor is to make sure that it doesn't way to go, Dave. We wish you all the best. Very serious. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, you know, stay noisy and be sure you ask for an EKG because they might not automatically give you an EKG. So, Mm -hmm. Thank Thank you, Dave. Dave. Yeah, we wish all the best. Um, And then also a follow up to our Beijing Olympics. You know, we have a listener, Leah, longtime listener. She has volunteered to be our Beijing correspondent. She lives there. She teaches at a school there. And uh, so she's been posting her own videos of various Olympic sites there in Beijing. Now she wants to remind people she can't get into any of the events because they're not (laughs) selling any tickets. But um, she is posting some fun things, some random random, you know, the mascots, those kinds of things. Those it's good. always fun. It's a fun way to see the Olympics through Leah's eyes. Leah hosts uh, her own podcast called two chick. It's very hard to say two chit chat chicks. And she has a Facebook group where she's posting more stuff, but she does have a thread over at the satellite sisters, Facebook, Facebook group. So keep us informed, Leah. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Leah. We were, you know, we're so excited to get any insight into, other than the usual uh, into the Olympics. So thank you. So speaking of which, you know, before the game start there, people are just desperate to figure out what are we possibly going to write about in the lead up to the Olympics. But this year, you may have noticed that there are just a lot of stories about the logistics of getting to the Olympics this time around, and even things that have nothing to do with COVID testing. So there was a great one uh, in the in the news the other day that I just want to share some tidbits with you, so that you have some some idea like what it takes for all of the athletes and all of the gear to actually get there to be on site. So, for instance, the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee sent. 160 pallets of equipment to China at a time. To do stuff like that, you have to hire the kinds of companies that do rock and roll tours. So, you know, oh, you did Bruce Springsteen? Okay, you can take the US team to Beijing. So that's all happening. There are 224 athletes going uh, in the American contingent. So that's the second largest number ever. And the thing about the thing the story talks about is how winter sports just have a lot more gear than summer sports. So they said, for instance, hockey players bring 10 or so sticks each. Oh, um, sure. that's, a, that's a lot. Yeah. Speed, speed skater, Brittany Bow said, I have always thought about this. She said, we're not allowed to bring the blades on the plane. So you have to check your blades, but the boots never leave my backpack. So they take their skates apart and they carry their boots with them. The skeleton racers, they're the ones that actually do have to pull an 80 pound case through the airport to check their skeletons. So that sounds like excellent exercise. 
Um, and then, so they have their sled and the runners and the spikes and the helmets and, and all of the gear. So this was Katie Ulander, who was a five-time Winter Olympian. She checked uh, six bags. Uh, and then if you're in the biathlon, for instance, obviously there are all these rules about how to transport guns and ammunition. Mm -hmm. So you got, you got to do that. But here's the good news if you're in curling. Uh, the Olympic officials on site sisters they provide the stones okay. those are about 40 pounds each. <laughs> uh -huh. so you don't yeah, have to bring your own extra weight on the plane yeah. yeah you don't have to bring your own stones if you're a curler and uh and the u.s governing body you don't have to bring your own bobsled so oh, i was wondering because uh, the bobsled yeah. <laughs> yeah. so the the bobsleds they ship in crates and then they add enough weights to the crates so there are mobile gyms on site so there's all of that but then my favorite athlete equipment detail was this one you know Michaela Schifrin we love her the skier unbelievable in every discipline because she skis so many disciplines including super g and slalom Michaela Schifrin brings as many as 60 pairs of skis with her. Sure. Wow. Yeah. 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 It depends on the event, the conditions. It, oh, like that's what if, a, yeah, what if she crashes and, you know, in a practice run, right? I mean, yeah. you don't want yeah. that to happen. Yeah. She could, uh, yeah, get that, get I mean, them all. 60 out. pairs. That 60. is really a lot of Do skis. it. Yes. Anyway. And then one last detail, this was in a separate story that I saw today. So then getting all the athletes there, normally you just get on a plane and you fly to the country, right? But that's not allowed this time around. You have to be on one of the chartered flights for Olympians. So the U.S. team again said, well, we're just going to charter our own plane and we'll pick everyone up along the way. And so there's been a person who's in charge of the seat arrangements on the plane so that there's enough space between the passengers. But also, this was the trickiest part. Athletes from different sports get dispersed. Our athletes from get dispersed around the plane evenly so that they don't like put the whole ski team together or the whole bobsled team together so that in case there's any contact tracing, in case anyone tests positive, they can't have the whole team go down. So oh, they, wow. they have to spread everyone out all over the plane. So teams are separated and thereby safer. <laughs> well, that's okay. a nice way to meet people. I mean, that's <laughs> nice. It's like a mixer. It's like it an is. Old, like a it mixer is on a plane. Get to, get to know the teammates outside of your sport. Anyway, you know, good luck, athletes. Uh, we are rooting for you. This has been an especially hard year to get there, and we hope you get there safely. All right, Liz, you have an entertaining sister's pick for us. I do. So this is a show that is just premiering on uh, Apple TV Plus. It's called The After Party. It's getting a lot of press. Have you guys read about this? Yes. No, I have. Yeah. No. Okay. So it's a comedy murder mystery. So I watched the first episode last night. I mean, it's silly. It's funny. It, the basic story is high school reunion gone wrong. So I think you can't go wrong with a story like that, right? right. Somebody yeah. dies at the high school reunion after party. And then throughout the, the story, as the story unfolds through the episodes, obviously they're trying to figure out who the murderer is. But the cast is fantastic. And Sam Richardson is in it. You know, he, you know him as Richard Splett from Veep. Yes. So funny. Mm -hmm. oh, Alana Glazer from Broad City. She's in it. Ike Barinholtz, oh my God, one of my favorite characters from the Mindy Project. And then the detective who comes in to solve the crime is Tiffany Haddish from, from Girls Trip. So just really great cast, really funny idea. But here's another thing they're doing with the story. They're, every episode is going to have a slightly different vibe so that the, the first episode was sort of produced as a um, rom-com but then they're going to have different genres. Each episode will focus on a different character and they will represent different genres of film. So I'm kind of interested in what that is going to be. It's anyway, the first episode was super funny. And I know sometimes we, we recommend a lot of different shows on a lot of different streaming platforms, which you may or may not have. So I saw this on Twitter last night that the after party, if you don't have Apple TV+, Plus, you can watch the first episode for free right now on YouTube until February 6th. So 
If you want to just try it out, you don't want to sign up for another streaming service, give it a go on YouTube, hashtag the after party, and, uh, and then you can decide. So that's my, that's my recommendation of the week. Thanks, Liz. Good tip about great. YouTube. Sounds fun. I didn't know they were doing that with the episodes. That sounds fun. Um, all right. That's our show for today. We'd like to thank Carol Wallace for being on the show for information about Carol's book or anything we talked about on the show today. You can always go to our show notes. Liz does a great job, tries to be complete. We have all the sponsor URLs there and the links and the promo codes. Uh, we have links to the stories we talked about, the guests, their bios, any books they might have. That's all in our show notes. So thanks to Liz, but thanks to Carol for being here. A big thanks to our engineers, Sergio Enriquez today did a great job. We appreciate you. Emily Loudermilk is our graphic designer. If you want to see her fun graphics and every week they surprise and delight us, um, you can go over to at sat sisters on Instagram or subscribe to pep talk. We, you, we use the graphics in both places. Thank you, Emily. Um, time for our to-do list. I'll start because tomorrow is my son Colin's 24th birthday. Oh, oh happy birthday, Colin. Happy birthday. Yeah. Little my little Colin. My little grandpa. All grown up. Yes. <laughs> he is. He's a grown man. Yeah, I he, have two grown, grown men. Yeah, yeah, I have two grown men now. It's weird. Uh, but it, it also is just a reminder. Colin was seven months old when we taped our first Satellite Sisters. Oh, so, my God. You can believe Wow. Whew, That's long, amazing. Long run, girls. Long run. Uh, so uh, happy birthday to Colin. Um, I'm getting him some, some items. I need to go shopping for his birthday today. Um, he's celebrating with his friends. They're renting a house out in the desert this week. So see, he's a grown up. He's planning his own party. He keeps saying to me, mom, I got it. I'm like, what do you want? <laughs> okay. You don't want, want balloons? To- you don't yeah, want, to- you want me to cook? Yeah, mom, I got it. Okay. So happy birthday to Colin. Another happy birthday to my college friend, Louise, who was also a groundhog February 2nd. So happy birthday, Louise. It's great that you're um, 39. Fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, this is Liz. I'm up next. So my to-do list last week, I mentioned that I had ordered a new computer that I got the new purple computer Mm -hmm. from uh apple the new imac you know i guess there aren't that many purples around because it's still not here supply chain supply chain issues on the purple but that did give me time i thought well i can't put this gorgeous new computer on my desk here at hq with all of this crap that is currently on on my (laughs) desk it was a good opportunity to like clean out my office area so that's what I did kind of not just clearing space for the computer but simplifying the whole look because I because otherwise you know the computer you need to highlight the beauty of the computer which means I have like bags now full of documents that need to be shredded and so my big job this week is to find a new shredding site because I used to, I loved having a Staples very nearby. That was my main shredding site. I loved going over there with big bags full of stuff to get rid of. But during the pandemic, the uh, Staples became a target, which I know I'm supposed to love, but I don't love it as much as I loved my Staples. So now I just have to find a new shredding site. So that's it. Find find a new place to shred. Number one goal for the end of the week. Liz, Liz, what do you got? Impressive. We're, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing the guest room, aka HQ, uh, on my next trip out to <laughs> okay, Santa yes. Monica with the with the Prince uh, computer. I'm just uh-huh. gonna call it that. Okay, good. Well, here in North Texas and really a big swath of the middle of the country, we're expecting this horrible winter storm. We're gonna have ice here in Texas, free, but really cold temperatures, and you know we haven't really. <laughs> recovered from the storm we had last February, that storm Uri, where we, you know, where we had a little problem with our power uh, in mm-hmm. most of the state. So ERCOT, which provides our, our power grid here in uh, Texas, they've assured us that they're ready for a, for this storm, but pretty much no one believes them. So um, I'm going to be doing <laughs> some storm, storm prep um, uh, over the next couple of days, getting ready for the ice at the end of the week. Wow, sounds like the perfect time for a, like a battery-operated air fryer or something. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, Liz. Maybe. <laughs> just just watch out for those dryer balls, Jewel. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Liz. All right, sisters. Have a great week. You too, Liam. You too, Liam. And don't forget, call your satellite sister. <laughs> <laughs>